first of all, Sam, thanks for uh, taking the time. Thanks for having me, Robert. Um, the uh, now you burst on the scene with the end of faith, and and more recently you've uh, published a letter to a Christian nation. Um, and on the basis of, of these two books and on the kind of uh, attention they generated, I kind of half imagine you having a business card that says Sam Harris Atheist, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that, that's very much your, your persona. Yeah. Is that okay with you? or? No, well, it's ironic that I never thought of myself as an atheist before I wrote The End of Faith. I never even was made aware of the atheist foundations in this country and the atheist think tanks. Um, and I, as I argue in, in uh, Letter to a Christian Nation, I don't think atheism is a, is a term we need, and it's, it's not a name that anyone really needs to answer to. Because well, what does it mean to you exactly? Is it somebody who's sure there's no God, or...? No, no. It, it, well, it's, it's somebody, in the same way that somebody's sure that there's no Zeus, you can be sure that there's no God of Abraham. It's, it's not the kind of certainty that says we have proved the absence of this thing. It's just that there's no good reason to believe in this thing. And, and so the, I mean, the reason why I object to the term atheism is that you know, we don't have terms for people who don't accept astrology, for instance. You don't have to wake up in the morning and define yourself around this variable, I'm not an astrologer, I'm not an astrologer, uh, and you don't join a club for non-astrologers. You just, you just use reason and evidence and common sense. I mean, these are the only terms I think you need, uh, or the only the, you know, schemas you need to resist the claims of astrology. And, you know, so when an astrologer comes forward and says, this isn't an exact science, uh, you ask for evidence, and when the ev evidence is not forthcoming, you dismiss these claims. And I think we can do the same with, with theistic religion. Okay. So, in a, strictly speaking, it's kind of the same as agnosticism as it's commonly understood, and that you're not completely sure of the absence of any god. Well, it's, uh, not, no, it's not agnosticism in the sense, I, mean, I think Bertrand Russell clarified this with his famous teapot, teapot. argument. You know, he's, yeah. can you prove that there's a China teapot in orbit around the sun? Uh, no. Or can, can you disprove the existence of this teapot? No. Well, then is it reasonable to be an agnostic about this teapot? Well, not really, because there's just no good reason to believe that there would be a teapot in orbit around the sun. So I mean, it's basically that, that that's but the lens I look I mean, at you're it. You're more sure that the Abrahamic God doesn't exist, or that uh, a, a benevolent and omnipotent God doesn't exist right. because there's so much suffering in the world, then you are that nothing that could remotely fit the description of a deity exists. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and you're, I mean, you're unlike and some people who would call themselves atheists, I think, in that you profess to ha take spirituality very seriously mm -hmm. and to even have a spiritual life yourself, I gather. Yeah. Uh, which you know, I think you would say is a kind of mysticism. Um, yeah, and I, I've used these terms, spirituality and mysticism, somewhat interchangeably, but I've used them in scare quotes because they come freighted with a lot of uh, baggage that I think is unfortunate and you know, somewhat embarrassing and hard to defend intellectually. But, and, I, and I've received a lot of grief from atheists for the final chapter of The End of Faith where I talk about spirituality and mysticism. But I, I think there's no question that human beings have, that there's a range of positive human experience that we can call spiritual or mystical, for lack of better words, because it, is, it tends to be accessed only by people who go into caves for a year and pray or meditate. I mean, who take extreme steps, almost invariably within a religious context, to discover what they can discover about their own consciousness using various techniques of introspection. And there's no question that there is a there there. Now, whether you can make metaphysical claims about the universe on the basis of those experiments, I, I, I think we there's can doubt. There's a there there but in the sense that a number of people have experiences that sound oh, similar. Uh -huh. there, there are unifying themes in the experiences of a lot of you. And if you had one of these experiences? Yeah, or more, yeah. I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time practicing meditation in... Uh, in kind of traditional silent retreat settings where you do, all you do is meditate for 18 hours a day, you don't read, you don't write, you don't talk, and, you know, I've done this compar in comparison with real, you know, great mystics, I've done this for a very short period of time, but I've done it for, you know, probably two years in, in total, you know, in like one to three month increments. And two years worth of extended retreats of yeah. a week or more. Yeah, yeah, that's intense. Yeah, and and it's and it's just a matter of getting your toe in the water, really. When you, I mean, I've had teachers who spent them one week's worth. Uh huh. So I get the idea, right. and it was worthwhile. But 
two years is a lot. Yeah, well, it was you know two years probably spread over ten. No, and no, still, yeah. you were staying in touch, uh, and you, do you still meditate? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so describe the experience or some experiences you have that convince you that there's something true about mysticism. Well, the uh, there, there's a whole range of of what are generally called conditioned meditation experiences that that are experiences that that emerge. Uh, by virtue of how you're using your attention, and they're they're quite temporary because they really are dependent on you being very concentrated and you're know, not distracted by anything in your environment or, or your thoughts. And these are these aren't really the center of the bullseye, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of mysticism. I mean, you get a lot of bliss and rapture, and you can have visionary experience, and and this is this is most of what is described in the literature on meditation because it's it's you can talk a lot about it, but. The more subtle stuff that that uh, within Buddhism goes by the name of emptiness often uh, is is not really uh, best categorized as a kind of phenomenal experience. It's really recognizing the status of every experience. So it's coincident with ordinary waking consciousness. Nothing nothing radical. Ha no, no fireworks have to go off in you for you to have this kind of mystical experience. And it's really, it's, it's simply the experience of ceasing to feel yourself separate from your experience. I mean, we, we go through life feeling like not only are we having an experience, we are the, somehow the center of it. We're, we're, we're the watcher of the experience. We're the thinker of the thoughts. We are uh, appropriating the flow of experience moment by moment. So there's almost, you know, we don't feel merely identical to our bodies. Uh, we feel like we're riding around in our bodies as a kind of a separate subject. And that, I, I think, can be easily demonstrated, uh, although it can take some doing for a person. It can be easily demonstrated that that's a false point of view and that you can, you can lose that sense of separation and you can, you can lose the sense that you are a, a locus of consciousness riding around behind your eyes, looking out at a world that's separate from yourself. And that loss is often called non-dual awareness or, or emptiness in some uh, uh, context. The, the collapse of the subject-object yeah. distinction. Yeah, so and it's, it's, very fr it's very freeing because so much negativity hinges upon maintaining that distinction. You know, fear, anxiety, hatred, I mean, all of that is, is predicated upon feeling a very strong sense of I on one side and, you know, object on the other. Yeah, so in, in the end of faith, you actually describe the collapse taking place in a situation where you're kind of looking at the inanimate world, or you're reading a book and suddenly you realize kind of, you know, you are the book, or, or maybe that's a caricature, but the, but the distinction between you and the book uh, begins to dissolve. Right. Um, but I, you, you didn't talk, I think, about the distinction between you and another person collapsing. Which is where the the moral dimension becomes prominent, right? But is right. that that's equally a, a part of the experience, or has been for you? Yeah, yeah. Well, the connection between uh, s mystical experience and morality, I think, is very interesting and and somewhat difficult to sketch out. I mean, one one point of contact is that when you look at the states of mind that make meditative uh, me good meditation possible, uh, they're not the, the morally repugnant states of mind. I mean, hatred and, and deception and, you know, scheming against others and I mean, selfishness and self-concern. I mean, these, these obscure, uh, they, they stir up thoughts. They, 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 they make it very difficult to pay attention to what you need to pay attention to in order to realize emptiness or any of these other subtler states. And it, it just so happens that, that states like loving kindness and compassion and uh, devotion and, and, and just inner peace, just, just feeling you know, like you're not racing to the next moment uh, in your life, that's a very good basis from which to have these insights. And there's a feedback because then these insights kind of reconfirm those, those states of mind. So you get you know, some of the great meditation masters I've met uh, you know, they don't tend to be cantankerous, uh, self-absorbed, uh, you know, megalomaniacal people. They, t they tend to be very loving and compassionate and, and easygoing people. And I don't think that's an accident. And that is a, that is a kind of a, an affective or emotional 
basis for for an ethical life. You know, when you when you when your default setting is to be concerned about the happiness of others, mm -hmm. and to recoil and to and to be concerned about their unhappiness I in in the presence of their unhappiness, to feel an urge to to alleviate you know their suffering. That is a, you know that's an ethical life, uh, and then we can write our ethical codes on top of that. But uh, yeah, yeah no, I mean there. it makes sense to me that you know y you would expect natural selection to create creatures that are self-interested, and that that perspective would pervade you in, in your normal waking life, wouldn't, but it wouldn't necessarily represent moral truth, and it seems logical that to get past that would take some sort of radical measures in terms of discipline, meditative discipline, or, or you know, chemicals that have yet to be invented or something. Right. Um, so it makes sense to me. The, um, so there, there is in this a little implicitly uh, some ideas about what consciousness is. I mean, you, uh, in the end of faith, you, you don't take a clear position on the mind-body problem, but you acknowledge at least its difficulty more than some people who call themselves atheists acknowledge. I mean, there's, right. there's a tendency for atheists to be materialists in, in a particularly simple-minded way. Um, and, to, and to think that you know we we figured out why there is subjective experience and, and don't you get it? It's just the brain, and, and I think a lot of times they really haven't thought about it right. as much as they, they might. Now, do you do you have a do you have a do you have a position on the mind body problem, or are you just sure it's a problem? Well, well I'm sure, sure it's a problem, problem, yeah, and I'm sure I don't know the answer to it, and I'm reasonably sure all of these people who think they know the answer to it also don't know the answer to it. I mean, I'm close enough to the literature and philosophy and neuroscience. You won't mention names. No. But feel free to. I'll bet, some of, I'll bet some of them have, have been on me in the live TV. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, and I, I think my, so I am somewhat agnostic on this and, and actually maybe even agnostic in the true sense, in the sense that you know, I, I doubt that we're equipped to know ultimately. I think our uh, I guess Colin McGinn has, has really argued for this, this, this idea that we just probably are not in a, in a position to resolve this mystery. Um, we may be, but I, I can't see how, I mean, let's say it is true that consciousness emerges purely out of uh, information processing and, and, in our case, neuronal complexity. You know, you, you wire together a, a sufficient number of neurons in the right way, and what becomes, what, what was completely unconscious, what had no interior dimension, suddenly lights up and there's, you know, all of a sudden something that it's like to be that brain. Um, maybe that's true. You know, let's just say, let's just stipulate that that is, in fact, a fact. You know, that still seems to me to be the mere declaration of a miracle. I don't understand how that is, is intelligible to us in the way, and there's many false analogies come rushing in here, like you know, an analogy with heat and, you know, and, and brittleness. I agree, and, they're all false. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and it's also not clear why it would be functionally necessary for, for that to creep into the brain. But this is, this is an, uh, an argument I've, I've had with, uh, with Dean Dennett, and, uh -huh. and uh, it's ultimately, the more you talk about it, the, the, the clearer it doesn't get. Uh, right. I mean, right. <laughs> consciousness is one of those issues on which yeah. people who disagree will disagree forever. Um, now, you, you, you say at one point in the end of faith, in terms of talking about spirituality and, and, and mysticism, there's clearly a sacred dimension to our existence, and coming to terms with it could well be the highest purpose of human life. Now, when religious people think of purpose to human life, they think of something that a god imbued. Life, right? And more generally, when people use the word at all, pretty much they often think of an imbuer. In other words, if, if a biologist says, well, the purpose of, of organisms is to get their genes in the next generation, they actually have in mind a process, natural selection, that, that quote, designed organisms with that goal embedded. Now, when you, when you say there, this could well be the highest purpose of human life, mm -hmm. what does that mean to a self-described atheist? Yeah, I don't know if I'm using purpose with a, a capital P in that sense, that it, that it has some kind of teleological implication or that it, it need extend beyond this life. But, when, you know, we're all trying to, to live as well as we can, and, and that the, the estimation of whether we're succeeding it has to be uh, against, measured against some sense of what constitutes a good life. You know, what is the good life? And, and I think the good life is... Uh, 
very clearly becoming as happy and loving and as free of fear uh, as you possibly can and, and, and helping to create a world where, the, where, where people become likewise. I mean, it's, we, want, we want well-being, whether we know it or not. We want to feel good, and I don't mean in a, in a trivial sense. I mean, we just want to see, we, we want the walls of our neurotic self-preoccupation and our, uh, um, all of these constraints upon our, our, our feeling well in any given moment. We want that, with those constraints to come down. And so the question is how to bring them down, and um, what are, the, what are the, the psychological and social consequences of them coming down. And I mean, you, t you spoke about self-interest as though it were uh, a counterpoint to, to, to mysticism or spirituality. And I, but I think self-interest can also just be reconceived. You know, it, it's possible to realize that it is in your self-interest to be selfless, in, in, certainly in certain moments. I mean, that self-interest is, you know, your, your greatest step toward personal happiness could require some heroic self-sacrifice, you know, and you wouldn't be able to live with yourself if you didn't make that, that self-sacrifice. Yeah, so. no, I think, I think the Buddhists are right that the, they didn't know about natural selection, but the way it does its work, the way it, it sets our motivational compass is it makes happiness this intrinsically, this kind of vanishing thing. It's the bait that keeps disappearing. So we pursue it but it doesn't, it doesn't last by nature. And, and right. you, uh, you, you identify spirituality with, uh, quote, a happiness that survives frustration of conventional desires. Right. And that's what you have in mind. You're saying that that, that may intrinsically involve a moral, a moral life, more, more moral than we kind of naturally, instinctively pursue. Yeah. yeah. That, would, that would be nice. I, I, I would like to think that's true. The, um, now, now, you say that mysticism is rational, like science. And uh, because it is, y when you meditate or whatever, you're kind of, well, maybe objectively is a funny word to use in this context, but you're evaluating the nature of experience and so on and coming to conclusions. What about somebody who meditates and feels a very strong sense of connection with a, a personal God or maybe a vague quasi-personal God or something? And why isn't, why isn't that rational or is it? Right, right. Well, one distinction I just would like to bring up because it, uh, is relevant here. John Searle, I think, made a great uh, distinction between subjective and objective in epistemological and ontological senses. So that you can be uh, ontologically subjective in the sense that you are, the, the facts you're talking about really are subjective facts. They're not objective facts. You're talking about, you know, what your dream looked like to you, you know. Uh, but you can be you can be objective in the way you talk about it epistemologically, which is to not make unfounded claims, to not be driven by you know various biases. So, I think we can talk about mystical experience objectively. I mean, it is subjectively uh, its 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 status is subjective, but we can talk honestly and uh, non dogmatically and really empirically about uh, about it, and we do that in. Inevitably, in studying, studying the mind, you know, even in doing functional neuroimaging of, of various brain states, we have to incorporate people's self-report. You know, a schizophrenic comes into the lab and says, I'm hearing voices continuously. That is, that is a, a, a subjective report about a person's phenomenology. And when you put, the, you know, when you put that person in a, a brain scanner and find that their auditory cortex is you know, activated uh, uh, inappropriately, and you correlate that with their their report, you haven't made this more objective. I mean, you've, it's this isn't this is science, but you're still using subjectivity as 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 part of uh, your apparatus. You are, but I mean, ultimately, when you tell me uh, that the the, the subject-object duality collapses when you meditate, uh -huh. to me, all you're saying is this seems really true to me, and I got to take your word for it. And when somebody says, when I meditate, I feel contact with with some sort of great being that exudes love or something, right. I'm taking their word for it. I mean, but but, but that that one entails a my, my claim is purely about the the character of my experience. The other claim is is metaphysics. Well, but, but you ultimately reach metaphysical conclusions about the nature of consciousness and its connection to so-called objective reality. Well, well no, it, I'm not drawing any conclusions about the relationship of consciousness and the brain or what's true of the universe. I'm saying that this sense that we are separate f 
from the sphere of our experience, that, there, that there's a thinker of our thoughts as opposed to just thoughts arising in consciousness. That sense is vulnerable to inquiry. And when you, you, when you inquire in a certain way, that feeling actually disappears. But I'm not claiming that, that, that you can then conclude from that experience that there's just the one mind you know, of the universe and, you're, and you have merged with it, um, no, as many proceed, mystics do. You then proceed on the assumption that you have found out something true about the actual nature of consciousness. Yeah, well, as experience. I mean, for instance, I, I could tell you an experiment. This hasn't been done, to my knowledge. But I can tell you an experiment that would, would either make my claim seem plausible or not. And uh, you couldn't use this experiment with the person who says, I'm in contact with God. Uh, I mean, if, for instance, we found the neural correlates of self-consciousness, you know, so we, we, we got people in, in, in MRI scanners and we made them self-conscious by, by telling them that, you know, people were looking at them, you know, we could see your face now, we've got a hundred people in the lab and we're all looking at the pores on your nose, and you, you got, you, you found some way of, of making self-conscious people feel exquisitely self-conscious in, in that context, right? And then you bring in meditators, uh, who say, well, I can lose my sense of self-consciousness. You know, I know what it's like to be self-conscious, but you can stare at my face all you want. I can drop that, and I can tell you when I'm dropping it. I can tell you those intervals where I lost that feeling of self-consciousness. You know, if we, if we could find the neural lo locus of, of self-consciousness, we would see you know, brain-dependent changes or you know, brain-correlated changes. Um, and that could resolve, that could then make sense in the same way that a schizophrenic who says he's hearing voices, it makes sense when you see what's going on in the auditory co cortex. Uh, it lends credence to his subjective claims. But you bring a Christian in there who says, you know, I'm sure that Jesus was born of a virgin because I was sitting in prayer and I saw Jesus and I saw, you know, I got the whole image that, that you know, authenticated to me that the Bible is perfectly true in every word. There, you, you need not necessarily doubt the, the character of their experience, but the claims they're making about reality are, are completely unlinked to any you know, empirical method you would use to authenticate those claims. I mean, that's a somewhat more specific religion claim than I had in mind for the, for the hypothetical person. But anyway, on the subject of religion, um, you're, you're, you know, you're kind of hard on religion, I'm sure you'll admit. Yeah. Um, yeah. You call it the one species of human ignorance that will not admit of even the possibility of correction you complain that it exhibits no progress. You write, if religion addresses a genuine sphere of human understanding and human necessity, then it should be susceptible to progress. Its doctrine should, be, should become more useful rather than less. Well, you know, I'd argue there has, there has been a certain kind of progress in broad swaths of religious tradition, I mean, in, in term, on the kind of scientific front. The Catholic Church finally did get around to apologizing to Galileo. You know, took a while. <laughs> but, 300 years. Well, you know, these things take a while to settle. But, 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 but the, the, you know, a, a lot of traditions, um, you know, a lot of parts of Christianity have taken account of, you know, geological and biological truth to some extent. They acknowledge uh, the truth of evolution. Um, on the kind of moral front, uh, you have, uh, there's been the evolution of the doctrine not certainly not subscribed to by all Christians, but the idea that you don't have to be a Christian to be saved. And actually, it turns out that uh, official Catholic doctrine, apparently, is that you can be an atheist and be saved. Mm -hmm. Now that, I would call a kind of moral progress. Things like, you know, the, the decline of kind of animal sacrifice, even. I mean, right. do, do you acknowledge any degree of improvement? You know, I mean, you, you actually write as if you don't. You, you, you say it will not admit of even the possibility of correction. Well, well, it's. it's uh, I think it's um, that has to be put in context. That particular line. I admit that that, for instance, in the West, Christianity has been moderated considerably. I mean, we are you know, no longer burning heretics alive for uh, you know on our street corners, but we were doing this for 500 years in Europe under the aegis of Christianity, uh, and that's it's a good thing. That's it's good that we have changed in that way, but. The thing to credit for that is not religion itself. It's not like people just started somehow finding reasons to moderate their behavior in the Bible. You know, reading the Bible more closely doesn't get you religious moderation. It doesn't get you an openness to uh, stem cell research or gay marriage or whatever else comes. You know, no, the reality that intrudes from yeah, yeah is, a is what does it. I mean, yeah. but but that's facts about the environment. I mean, that that's a. Good thing if the system is amenable to change via facts coming in from the environment. 
Well, well it, it's amenable to change w under considerable duress. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's really been, a, you know, a, a collision between religion and science and religion and secular politics. And the collision, we're living through the collision uh, in the states now. And so it's not, I don't think you should, I mean, one, one line I have in the end of faith is that the, or, the, the doors leading out of religious literalism don't open from the inside. I mean, they're always kicked open by by the outside, by secularism, by tensions with the world, by the, by the realization that, that uh, you know, now we understand the nervous system and demonic possession is not the best diagnosis of, of your child's epilepsy. Epilepsy is, you know, so then, so the moment we understand epilepsy, the, the good doctors of the church stop giving these diagnoses and stop trying to drive out demons for, for the most part. You can say somewhat the same thing about medicine itself and, and even about science. I mean, Thomas Kuhn, made the point that the way new par scientific paradigms come into being is actually not that the adherents of the old paradigms come to see the truth of the new paradigm, they just die. Right. And young people who came of age as the new paradigm was coalescing are, are become the new generation of scientists who, who accept quantum physics and realize that Newtonian physics alone won't get it. So I mean, uh, look, religion is definitely more constrained by its history than science. I just it seems to be right as if there, the, there's no hope of progress within it. And ultimately that matters in terms of what, what you're going to try to do about the world. Whether there is hope for productive change within a religious framework or there is not. Yeah, yeah well, it, it's, not, it's not that there's no hope for progress in the world. But, but I think the hope lies in, in a truly open-ended human conversation which, which requires of all parties that they have their beliefs about the world and their behavior uh, open to being modified by new evidence and new argument. You know, we, a new piece of data emerges, for instance, that uh, you know, AIDS is really spread by, by sexual activity. Uh, that, uh, acknowledging that fact uh, uh, is in fundamental contrast with the, the dogma of Catholicism that, that, that contraception use is sinful. You know, so you have a, I mean, these, there's no reconciling these two things. And the, the, the Vatican and the Catholic Church generally, to its discredit, has been very slow to, to give way uh, in the face of this truth. And so you have Catholic ministers in sub-Saharan Africa, where three to four million people die every year from AIDS, literally preaching the sinfulness of condom use in villages where the only information about condom use is the representation of the ministry. So I think this is, I mean, I, I've said before, I think this is genocidal stupidity, and we, we respect it you know, there's some criticism of it, but we respect it to the degree uh, that it's, you know, everyone needs to be free to believe what they believe about God, and you know, this, is, this is the Christian church after all. If this, were, if this were a secular institution doing this, I mean, there would be criminal charges uh, brought against it. I mean, it would be, it would be really resisted by, by people because it is just, uh, it's incredibly exploitative of people's ignorance, and it leads to death, you know. So, um, I think, I mean, so here's a, you know, a case study. Let's say this dogma really gets rewritten in the next 10 years. You know, let's say the, the Pope announces, you know, we, we had it wrong, condom use is actually part of the, uh, you know, the, the holy office of, of, uh, of um, the Catholic faith now, and you, you know, must use condoms at every opportunity. So who are we going to credit for that? Reli Catholicism? You know, the fact that it took decades of, of uh, you know, this promulgation of human misery and, and criticism from, you know, op-ed writers in the New York Times? Or are we going to credit the fact that, once again, science and secularism and basic common sense has, has won a, an inch of ground from religious dogmatism? Okay. Um, the, uh, yeah, you touched on something there. Uh, you are, um, I mean, a lot of people condemn religious extremism. You can condemn religious moderates as well. Uh, and, and in a certain sense, um, tolerance. I mean, uh, something you said in uh, one of your books is, given the link between belief and action, it is clear that we can no more tolerate a diversity of religious beliefs than a diversity of beliefs about epidemiology and basic hygiene. Um, it's, 
I mean, first of all, it, this will strike some people as ironic, because surely one thing you don't like about some fundamentalist faiths um, is that they are uh, intolerant, right? So to, to, to embrace intolerance as a, as a doctrine to that degree will strike some people as paradoxical. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, it, I think it's, that's an artifact of, of language in a way. It's, you know, I, I'm calling for the same intolerance that we rather effortlessly uh, display in the face of other consequential irrational behavior. You know, if you have people, um, you know, it, it's telling that, that only, um, that a religion has to be very well subscribed before uh, people take it seriously as a religion. If it's just got 10,000 members, it's a cult, and it's a crazy cult, you know. It, so it can believe the same kinds of things that uh, religious people believe. It just can you know, have different symbols, different names for its gods, uh, slightly different practices, and everyone looks at it from the outside thinking this is very strange and you know if they if they do anything to to tread upon our happiness on the basis of their lunatic beliefs we're gonna uh, you know we're not going to tolerate it. Um, and likewise with other curious things people believe. You know if, if we had a someone running for public office who was sure that Elvis was still alive and, and just uh, express this certainty at every opportunity. He would not get very far and people would tell him why. People would say, listen, you know, Elvis is not still alive. It's irrational to believe it. You have marginalized yourself from our public discourse with this crazy idea. And no, you're not going to be, you're not going to sit on the board of directors. And no, you're not going to get into Harvard, uh, you know, if you're, not, I mean, it's just, you, we exclude people who have high levels of certainty uh, uncoupled to good evidence and good argument unless these certainties go by the name of religious certainty, unless they're, unless they're covered by the, the, uh, kind of the all-purpose uh, uh, solvent of, of faith, where, where people are given permission to believe things strongly without evidence. And that, so that's the double standard I'm, ta I'm talking about. Religious claims are less amenable to empirical evaluation than some other kinds of claims. And there are some religious claims, I think, that you wouldn't rule out entirely. I, 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 I could construct a conception of a not very personal kind of theism that you would probably not rule out entirely, actually. Um, but when you write, we should no more tolerate a diversity of religious beliefs than whatever. Well, that, that would, that would yeah. rule out that, that religious belief. And ultimately, it sounds to people as if you're saying, we should not tolerate any conception of religion other than Sam Harris's, right? Well, no, I, I, it's just we should not uh, tolerate ascendant false certainties. You know, I mean, we'll look, just look what we have in the Muslim world. It, it's helpful to talk about specifics. We have a, we're confronting in, in the Muslim world uh, the, the spectacle of some considerable number of, of people who really believe that cartoonists should be decapitated for, for merely depicting the prophet. Okay, this is a religious belief. It's, you know, there's no graven images. Uh, the, the prophet is, is beyond any form of criticism. We're not going to tolerate uh, uh, your drawing the prophet, and if we could, we would kill you for it. Okay, this is believed by God knows how many millions in the Muslim world. It's not you know, we're not talking about 50,000 people. We're talking about a huge number of people. That's a deal breaker. You know, there, there is no, we should not be apologizing for drawing the prophet. We should not be accommodating this true s surge of me medievalism. I mean, this is not compatible with a global civil society. And we really have to call a spade a spade there. I mean, there, there is no future in which we have seething hordes of people calling for the deaths of of newspaper editors. I mean, everyone, ag everyone agrees on that, and the disagreement is over what you do about that mm -hmm. and uh, how you change people's beliefs. And I guess this is where I question your approach of not just wanting to moderate religious belief, mm -hmm. but end it, right? I, I mean, I'm just wondering how effective your, your project is. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a, a passage um, in one of your books where, where you um, acknowledge, I think implicitly, that you don't have any credibility with Muslim extremists because what you, you, uh, what you say is um, 
that the moderates within the Muslim community are going to have to do it, okay? This transformation to be palatable to Muslims must also appear to come from Muslims themselves. It does not seem much of an exaggeration to say that the fate of civilization lies largely in the hands of moderate Muslims. I have a couple of questions. One is actually how much street cred do moderate Muslims have with extremists? But the other question is, if you're trying to get moderate Muslims to do the work, how much street cred do you have when you come to them and, and grab them by the shoulders and say, you know, I want you to moderate your religion. And by the way, you're crazy to think that there even is a God. I mean, right. you, you're going to be completely excluded from their consideration. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and isn't it a little ambitious to hope that we could put an end to theism? I mean, it, it just seems, well, you understand the question. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, there's, there's a paradox lurking here, and I haven't quite resolved it. I mean, on the one hand, it's true that the path to genuine secularism is, has to move through moderation. I mean, I don't think we're going to create 1.4 billion atheists in the Muslim world. So uh, the goal, the short-term goal, has to be religious moderation everywhere. And we have to, I mean, we have 44 percent of the American people who think that Jesus is going to come back in the next 50 years. It's a bad idea. It's incompatible with creating a durable civilization, I would argue. We have to find some way of moderating them, too. So, so yeah, I agree that the, the goal is to get more moderates. And yet my, my criticism of moderation still stands, because it moderates, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, don't allow us to criticize fundamentalists to the, to the degree we should. Wait, wait, and, but you're saying we should not tolerate the beliefs of moderate Muslims. Yeah, but, but what form will this, this intolerance take? It's not going to take the, the form of the gulag or passing laws against Islam uh, it, or, or Christianity. No, but is it productive to even go around, you know, kind of saying it to them a lot? Don't you get it? You're wrong. There's no God. I mean, well, I, I, just don't, I just don't see what, what good comes of it. Well, you have to pick your moments. I mean, I'm not arguing that everyone should talk the way I talk. I wouldn't want the President of the United States speaking about Islam the way I speak about Islam. That would be a disaster. Um, I'm, I probably want him to think about Islam the way I think about Islam, uh, because I think my, my analysis of it is, is true. But no, there is a room for um, you know, artful uh, uh, obfuscation of the issues, perhaps. I mean, there is a room for di diplomacy. But the, the, the tension here is between, and to speak specifically about Islam, I mean, we need moderate Muslims. We need people who, who really believe that Osama bin Laden has hijacked a peaceful faith, and, and uh, uh, we, need, we need it to be true that Muslims think that, that jihad is just an inner struggle and not holy war. Uh, great, we need that. But the reality is, is that Osama bin Laden is not a marginal figure. He's not the Reverend Jim Jones of the Muslim world. And jihad, historically and textually, is most readily interp interpreted as holy war, not an inner struggle. And for so-called moderate Muslims to stand up and just deny that, you know, and just say Osama bin Laden is, is a non-issue and jihad is just uh, a, a spiritual struggle, that is, you know, an apology for the faith and, and a, a, a genuine um, mo moment of dissembling about the true causes of religious violence in the Muslim world. So it, it, there's a tension here. We need moderates. But moderates are the ones who, cl who are, who are uh, denying the link between religious ideas and, and violence, which is, which is perfectly apparent. Okay, on, on the question of how you would turn extremists into moderates, um, you have been uh, a little dismissive of what are commonly called the root causes of extremism in, in the Muslim world. Um, you pretty much dismiss the idea that the problem is humiliation or, or insults to, to their dignity. Um, at one point you write uh, that, you know, you characterize the conventional view as stressing uh, the collusion of Western powers with corrupt dictatorships, endemic poverty, uh, lack of economic opportunity. So and you say, I will argue that we can ignore all of these things or, or treat them only to place them safely on the shelf, in other words, more or less dismiss them. Um, because the world is, is filled with poor, uneducated, and exploited peoples who do not commit acts of terrorism. I, I mean... The and, but the, and there's another part of that, uh, that it's also filled with middle class, well-educated, 
right. engineers and architects who fly Your planes architect. in the building. Yeah, yeah. so, okay. so, as so as it's, a, it's a perfect part, association. As for the first part, and I should stress, these are not the particular root causes I would personally stress, like poverty so much, but there are root causes I would stress. And you're kind of dismissive of root causes, and, and you say, uh, we, can, we can dismiss them because the world is full of poor, uneducated people who do not commit acts of terrorism. Well, the, the world is full of people who smoke cigarettes and don't get lung cancer, right? But you wouldn't deny that smoking causes lung cancer. No, no, okay. but, it, but this, is, this is the problem. I, I'm all in favor of, of understanding root causes. I just think that the root causes of certain acts of violence, not all violence, but certain acts of violence, really are right there on the surface because these people are telling us why they're doing what they're doing. They, all the variables that, that, that uh, case, you know, poverty, you know, mistreatment at the hands of powers, etc. So what are they telling us that is the real cause? The jihad. I mean, to speak specifically about Islam. I mean, we, we're talking... Right, but the doctrine of jihad has been on their books forever, mm -hmm. and yet there are times when it doesn't surface and times when it does. There must be something that's changing. Well, yeah, it's, it's the, the fact that you can't really live in isolation in our world anymore. I mean, the fact that you know, a Muslim will go to uh, Hamburg to find work and live in Hamburg and be confronted with the, with the shocking evidence of sin that is Western culture, uh, find it so spiritually oppressive that he's driven into this, his insular uh, and uh, an increasingly radicalized Muslim community, spends all day long at his mosque talking about the, the, the pleasures that await martyrs in paradise and just the, the horrors of, of infidel uh, society, uh, won't look a woman in the eye because it's such a spiritual transgression, and this is Muhammad Atta. You know, so, so modernity is kind of the root cause. Yeah. Well, well no, but it's not. It's modern, modernity is fine. You know, I mean, there's other problems we can talk about in modernity. But the, the root cause is, I mean, if you want to ascribe it to humiliation, it is a re religion, uh, religious-based humiliation. It is a theological humiliation. These are people who think they have the perfect word of the creator of the universe. They expect their religion to be triumphant in this life and their societies are, are foundering uh, because, uh, for a variety of reasons, and, and testifying to the inadequacy of their worldview at some level. So they're humiliated because they, they, uh, they're not uh, in power, uh, and they expect to be in power, and uh, they interpret, they view all of this, all of the inequities in the world through the lens of their religious literalism. Now, if they had a different religious literalism, we wouldn't have a problem. You know, so I mean, one thing I argue is that you know, Islamic fundamentalism is only a problem for us because the fundamentals of Islam are a problem for us. We're not, you know, if Jains were, I mean, Jainism is this religion of India, incredibly peaceful, they're vegetarians, they won't kill a fly. If the Jains were poor and, and uh, suffering, you know, high levels of illiteracy, et cetera, et cetera, the Jains would not be practicing suicide bombing because they would be viewing this subjugation through the lens of their Jainism, which, if it, it, however irrational it might be, it has a very different behavioral and logical consequence. Well, there are certainly some religious doctrines that are less amenable to radicalization than others, but that's not the same as saying that there are kind of no factors on the ground over which we have control that exert a radicalizing influence, right? And, and would you accept my point that just the analysis as you do it you say, these can't be the cause because there are people who possess these properties who don't become radicals. Well, that is like saying smoking can't cause cancer because there are smokers who don't, have, don't get cancer. And, you're saying, and then you're in turn saying um, what you added, which is that then there are affluent, well-educated people who do become terrorists. Uh, well, there are people who have, uh, who have lung cancer who didn't smoke. I mean, all four quadrants are always filled up. And it just seems to me the problem is sufficiently complicated that we really, you need a subtle kind of analysis, I mean, more subtle than, than, than sentences like this are. Well, I, I see, I don't think it's sufficiently complicated in that it, we're really talking about the behavioral consequences of ideas. You know, if you believe that it's raining outside uh, and you don't want to get wet, you, you're going to reach for an umbrella. And, and so they ask for, well, what was the proximate cause of your reaching for an umbrella? Well, we could talk neurology, we could talk your upbringing, we could talk, you know, socioeconomics. But the proximate cause is 
you are convinced it's raining outside and you, and you, and you uh, don't want to get wet. And uh, that, at a, as a first approximation, is a good way to explain your behavior. We have an easily, apparent, easily as apparent an explanation of religious violence. Uh, and, I mean, you look at what's, you know, why does someone like... But what's the explanation? Well, because these, these people really believe what they say they believe. Well, sure they do, but again, this is not the way Islamic doctrine has expressed itself traditionally. And your assertion that all it is is kind of the, the certain aspects of modernity that are encountered in Resident or whatever your explanation is, it, it's just not self-evidently obvious. There, there are lots of candidates for what forces on the ground are leading to this change. And, uh, you know, it just seems to me it's a complicated... Let, well, what, well, let me just add one piece yeah. here, because I think, um, and this may be uh, surprising to you, I think the situation would actually be worse if they had better education and more money. And I mean, if, if, if Islam was actually as viable in the face of modernity as, you know, secular capitalism, you know, if you could just be, if you could live like, live in the worldview of the Taliban and really become a superpower, um, that is the worst possible situation. So the idea that somehow, um, if they only had more money, more stability, more you know, technical progress, uh, more affluence, um, then these problems would go away. I, I, I doubt that well, highly. Actually, I think a lot of moderate Muslims are in that category. And if, you, and if you in that category are not moderate, it's true. But a lot of the kind of you know, Pakistani Muslims who send their kids to Oxford and so on, you know, they fly business class, they do business with people who are Muslims. Yeah, yeah. They love people who are Muslims because they're getting something out of their relationship with people who aren't Muslims. Right. They don't, they, they feel part of that world. They feel they're getting something out of involvement in that world. And it's possible that if you could give uh, more Muslims that sense, it's at least possible. I, I, I think we, we both agree that they look at the world out there and, and view it as hostile toward their religion. And the question is, uh, are the forms of hostility that they perceive subject to our successful manipulation in a way that doesn't compromise our own values, right. kind of inexcusable. Well, well, let me just clarify one thing. I'm not talking about all Muslims, and I'm, not ta I'm certainly not talking about an ethnicity. I'm not talking about Arabs. I'm talking about ideas. So I'm, I'm talking about you know white kids from Marin County who go to fight with the Taliban, as much as I'm talking about people like Osama bin Laden. Um, and what you're describing there is the moderating virtues of secularism and globalization and, and just having everyone's culture uh, you know, freely available. The fact that you can go to an Indian restaurant tonight and have Indian food, that has a certain moderating influence on, upon you know, human consciousness because it's just we don't have the, the, the right to our provincialism anymore at some level because everything is, is in plain view. And that's a good thing and that should happen to the Muslim world and you know we can only hope that it, it happens as quickly as possible, and we and that will be part of the mechanism that gives us Muslim moderates. And another piece here that we haven't mentioned, which I think is very important, is the the empowerment of women in the Muslim world. I mean, we have 50 percent of the Muslim world that is is living you know, a life of of, uh, of really uh, oppressive subjugation under the the edicts of Islam, and. Um, it doesn't matter how many mo women you can stand up in burqas who say they want to be in burqas. I mean, they, they, ultimately, they're wrong to want to be in burqas. I mean, this is something that, that I argue in my book. And we have to win a war of ideas with them. And the women are wrong to think that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think any woman, any woman who, I mean, you can raise a child so that at, you know, the 16th year of life, she will stand up and say, I want to be in a burqa. And I don't think we should take that testimony too seriously, ultimately. I mean, we, well, it, but everyone has been brought up with something and, and have been indoctrinated in some sense, including you. I mean, I, I would also take the view on, in, on behalf of a certain moral relativism that, um, you know, everyone I know who's kind of uh, in my shoes has daughters on the verge of teenagehood has a certain amount of trepidation because of the nature of modern Western culture. There's a, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the teenage years. Mm -hmm. um, and some traditional societies, not just Muslim, but you know, traditional societies in various faiths, are set up in a way uh, that those things are less likely to go wrong. And, and, and I, I don't mean I want to move to those places. I just mean I think I should be a little careful I'm not really in a position to say that they've got everything wrong. I'm not, I don't, you know, support polygamy or anything, but 
Uh, well, let's take an extreme, because I'm totally sympathetic with that concern. I, I don't have kids yet, and, I, and so I, I can only imagine what it's like to be a father of girls, but I can well imagine that you know, your, your teenage girls are growing up and you see the sexualization of culture, right. and that's, that's problematic. And, and there's, some, there's some more or less optimal way to balance this, you know, personal freedom, not stigmatizing sexuality, and yet also protecting girls from you know, the rapaciousness of, of male, the male world, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then you have various possible reactions to that. I mean, you have Abercrombie and Fitch that is, we've learned is design, designing thong underwear for eight-year-olds and you know they get boycotted by the marketplace because that has gone too far but then you have Mullah Omar over here who's who's uh, you know getting girls stoned to death for for uh, fornicating or even getting raped I mean honor killing is really the reductio ad absurdum of that approach to to problematizing female sexuality and I think there's there's going to be a balance point somewhere and I just am quite sure that the, the Islamists of the world or the Christian fundamentalists have not found that balance point. Okay. Let, me, let me back into kind of the same question about what the ultimate sources of bad behavior are, like, you know, violence and, and so on, by talking about a criticism that you got for your first book and then you addressed it in the second book, Letter to a Christian Nation, as well as a kind of addendum in your first book. Mm -hmm. um, it's the uh, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Paul Pot question. Um, these, uh, you know, all these people seem to have been more or less atheists. Hitler's religiosity is a little bit disputed, but he certainly wasn't professing Christian faith when, when he was doing, doing his most horrible things. And, and, and the point these people are making, I mean, when you, when you look at it, it's kind of striking. I mean, almost all national political leaders of the 20th century did profess a religious faith clearly. The people I just mentioned account for the overwhelming majority of atrocities inflicted by political leaders on their own people. It seems natural to conclude that the most dangerous thing in the world is an atheist political leader. I mean, just statistically, you seem to be compelled to that conclusion. Now, I know you have answers, right. but, 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 but it's an interesting, it's a notable fact. Yeah, I just think it's, uh, once again, it's a, an artifact of uh, the words we're using. I mean, the word, the using a word like atheist and, and s somehow then imagining that because, the, uh, because Stalin was irreligious and, and uh, an enemy of Christianity, his genocide uh, of uh, his people uh, was somehow caused by his opposition to religion or his lack of faith in God. And I, th I just think that's um, you know, it's no, a false. One, one needs artifact. some explanation of something statistic, so statistically improbable that the tiny minority of non-religious political leaders would do almost all of the domestic slaughter done in the 20th century. That is so statistically unlikely well, no, that it's not enough to say I don't think it was their atheism. Well, what, what, how do you explain the bizarre statistics there? Well, I, I can just see why they did what they did. I mean, they, they had beliefs that they were quite articulate about, and. They were moved by their beliefs. You know, Hitler believed that the Jews were the the, the cause of uh, the downfall of uh, uh, German society, and the, G the Jews were just racial poison and had to be exterminated. And that was so. Now, where did he get that idea? I mean, conveniently for my thesis, you trace that idea back. You find that anti-Semitism is a product of religion. It's a product of Christian fulminating against the Jews for thousands of years. This, the idea that the Jews stand in repudiation of Christ. But he also, he also wanted to wipe out gypsies and handicapped people. Did he inherit that from Christianity? Well, no, I mean, there, there are other kinds of tribal hatreds that well, come. Well, but, but, but that's my point. It seems to me in that case, nationalism is a more elegant explanation than religion. Uh, uh, fanatical German yeah. nationalism accounts for all the people he killed, whereas religion no. as an explanation leaves some of the, 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 the things still unaccounted for. No, no. Well, well they're, just, they're just different. This is not a contradiction. They're just different reasons why people kill people. You know, there's greed, too. You know, he wanted to, he wanted a thousand-year Reich. You know, he wanted to just, he wanted to be, there's just megalomaniacal thinking. He wanted to be, you know, the, the uh, Fuhrer for, to the entire world. But um, when you ask, where did anti-Semitism come from? Why is it when the, when the, the stormtroopers moved into Poland that, that the, the, the Poles so easily set upon their Jewish neighbors uh, and, and the Latvians and the, you know, the Lithuanians. And 
why is it that people were, were so gleeful about exterminating the world's Jews, uh, you cannot get anti-Semitism without uh, this history of demonizing well, Jews. Well, then where did the anti-Gypsy, if that has no comparable history in religious doctrine? I mean, well, the, the question... Well, no, like, where does racism come from? You know, well, exactly. You see, there, here's... There is tribalism. Here is, exactly. Yeah. Here's the question I'm asking. In cases like this, where it would seem to me like it has more to do with nationalism or, or other forces, you, you tend to insist that it's a form of religion. Well, no, no, you, you, it's, well but, but I mean, you're writing, you, you, in addressing this, you say, communism of Stalin and Mao was little more than a political religion. At its heart was a rigid ideology, it was cultic, it was irrational. Right. Well, just, just as much as you could say this was a political religion, you could say uh, when religion reaches kind of to toxic levels of, of group cohesion, it is a theological nationalism, okay? And, and the larger question I'm getting at is, isn't it possible? I mean, my view is religion is actually composed of a lot of parts of human nature. One is this kind of groupishness that can turn aggressive. It has to do with, with lots of other parts. But uh, isn't it, it possible that religion is just one manifestation of this form of uh, human nature? There are others, such as nationalism. The, the problem is this part of human nature and the, the question of what circumstances excite it, you know, arouse it, uh, is one that isn't fundamentally about religion. Uh, and whereas I, 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 from your writing, I, I get the sense that you think a huge majority of the world's problems boil down to religion per se. Yeah, well, let me reconcile it here because I think it's, it's easily done. I think the problem is dogma. I think the problem is false certainty that, it, that people find incredibly energizing and, and cer false certainties that are immune to criticism because you have some social context in which it has become taboo to criticize these certainties. And when these, when these certainties are ascendant and they are emotionally empowering and they, and they uh, balkanize your world into uh, us-them categories where you have, in, in the case of religion, Christians against Muslims, against Jews. In the case of politics, you have you know, the true believers of, of uh, uh, the Reich and everyone else, um, these divisive certainties which are immune to criticism, that's the problem. So dogma is the problem and my argument is just that religion has more than its fair share of dogma and it, it's the only case in which dogma is not a, actually a, a pejorative word. I mean we talk about religious dogma as though dogma were a necessary feature of the whole enterprise. Uh, and so, so that's, that's what I find to be so dangerous about religion and it's also these are, these are differences between people which they are willing to live and die for in a way that, that doesn't tend to be true in politics. It can be true in politics, but it's not, you know, it, it can be true of well, Red Sox and Yankees fans, I but it doesn't tend to be true. uniquely destructive doctrine, such as the idea that if you kill a lot of people, you will get a special place in heaven. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not so sure that the afterlife intrinsically is a bad, I mean, I, I don't know what the scorecard is on how much good has been done by people who, thought they would, you know, go to heaven by doing nice things to people as opposed right. to people, you know, but there are certainly uniquely uh, problematic and toxic uh, religious doctrines, but uh, I, I, you know, the, the question I'm trying to, to back into is, again, my view, which is just different from yours, I think, that religion is often kind of a mediating variable. It's mediating a part of human nature that that is unfortunately excited under certain circumstances. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that you think it often assumes secular form. Uh, I mean, I thought, you know, right after 9-11, when for a while you really couldn't question anything George Bush said. I don't know if you remember this, but it was like really unpopular to say, to question that, which I think is an unhealthy situation. You know, I would also say that what you just described as being part of a, a worldview, us against them, and attributing a kind of unity to them is something that some people uh, that's a way that some people characterize George Bush's worldview, including a part of it that I think you buy into, kind of, the idea that the problem is Islamic fascism writ large, as opposed to my view that, you know, if you look at the, the various Muslims in the different parts of the world who are unhappy, originally their unhappiness was growing out of separate grievances, you know. In, in Palestine, originally, uh, it, it was very much an issue about Israel, and it was not very religious. 30 or 40 years ago, I don't know if you remember, but there was, the opposition to Israel had much more the character of Arab nationalism 40 years ago than it, right. does, than it does now. 
Um, so anyway, that, that's why don't you say whatever you'd say, and then we can move on. Yeah, I, I think that it's not. Uh, I mean, you can start at, at it from the other end. You can say, all right, the, the enemy is not religion. Let's not talk about religion. Uh, let's just talk about uh, evidence and what is rational to believe about the world. Let's just start from first principles, and let's be intellectually honest. Uh, and then whenever we encounter people who have bad evidence and bad arguments for their beliefs, we're going to criticize them. I mean, we're, we're not going to we're not going to admit them to our graduate schools. We're not going to promote them to public office because they're being irrational and and uh, we're going to stigmatize flagrant irrationality. Well, then who are we going to wind up stigmatizing when we do that? We are just going to be blasting religion all day long when we do that, but just by necessity. Because when you hear what religious people think about the world, when you hear that 45% of Americans think Jesus is coming back in 50 years, when you hear that 53% of Americans think the universe is 6,000 years old, when you, when you, and if you did these polls in the Muslim world, you know, we would no doubt get flabbergasting data you would stand in perpetual criticism of the bogus certainties of the better part of humanity. And the question is, how do you win a war of ideas in the, in the face of that? You know, that's one question. The other question is, what do you do when, uh, the, when these certainties are arrayed in such a way that they're causing people to fight over incompatible you know, religious claims upon real estate, for instance? I mean, the fact that the Jews, the Jewish settlers, you know, need this real estate because it's been sanctified by the, you know, the footprints of Abraham. Uh, and if we, if we offered to give them British Columbia, they wouldn't take it. You know, they would be free from Muslim hatred and, and there'd be great peace, uh, you know, there'd be a great peace dividend uh, born of that, but they wouldn't take it for religious reasons. Um, and so it seems to me that, that however you want to mince words here, we have a major problem between what's going on uh, in, under the name of all these rival uh, religious conceptions of the world and the, the tensions of modernity and the fact that we are trying to build a global civilization. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree on that. And, and the question is how you, how, you change, uh, how you change people's views. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I'm the first to admit that I am one voice that uh, maybe should not be duplicated too much. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I'm not, I, I don't think everyone should speak the way I speak. I'm playing a certain role. Dan Dennett's playing a different role, uh, which I appreciate. I mean, there there are you know there there's a good cop bad cop routine that I think is appropriate in different contexts. But I you know I think we should be honest about what is reasonable to believe and and what and why actually people do get up in the morning and decide to you know kill their daughters for being raped or or you know etc. Okay. Um, now. Just, just briefly back to the question of whether religious belief might not be in any sense um, defensible. The, uh, you know, you, you, you have a, a, a kind of a spiritual a spirituality, an ethic that follows from it, and it has to do with kind of kindness toward people and so on. I mean, what if, what if it is the case that either because of human nature or because of specific people's natures, um, they are not going to be able to lead a very full version of that ethical life unless they have a sense that there's a loving God that wants them to. Right. Um, and I kind of think maybe for some people that is the case. Uh, what, I mean, I assume, first of all, you wouldn't say that's a validation of the belief. Uh, is it, does it affect the way we should talk about that belief? I mean, do we really need a scorched earth policy against all forms of religious belief? I mean, I, you, you would already take another example. I'm sure a lot of money uh, went to victims of Hurricane Katrina that was raised in you know churches, synagogues, and mosques or whatever, and uh, probably some of it just would not have been raised. Such such is human nature, for better or worse. Um, how do you respond when people point these things out? Well, I just don't think we're in a position to know because. I mean, it's, it's almost like asking, uh, it's almost like looking at the fact that most of the people who have ever done construction work, you know, in this city, for instance, believed in God. So now who's going to build all the buildings if, if we just created a lot of atheists? I mean, <laughs> I think that's a little different. I mean, I don't think they were doing it out of their religious, they were getting paid by the hour, right? Yeah, I mean, but but, but, but the, the, in, in the larger sense, there really has been nobody else to do the job on, on so many fronts. I mean, everyone, it's like, I mean, one example I give is that you know everything that was accomplished by human beings prior to 1950 
was accomplished by people who didn't understand anything about DNA and the molecular basis of human inheritance. That's not an argument for saying a misunderstanding of biology is a good thing to, to, to perpetuate. Um, I think that people, that children can be raised to, I mean, one argument I have against religion is that it, it actually it gives good people bad reasons to be good when good reasons are actually available. I mean, we, we can find good reasons to care about people in, you know, after a hurricane happens in New Orleans or, or people starving in, in uh, Africa. Although by your own account, um, the good reasons aren't kind of readily available. What I mean by that is in your case, your, your spiritually based ethic has required mm -hmm. an immense investment of time, like a total of two years just meditating more or less, right. and discipline. And uh, one question is how realistic is it to expect everyone, uh, well that's the first, I have two questions about that. First question is how realistic is it, it to expect everyone to do that, if, if that's what it takes to do it in a kind of secular, rational way. Well, see, that's, but that's not required to give you ethics. I mean, I think there, there's a, an interesting uh, phenomenological conversation to be had about the relationship between spirituality and ethics. But, you know, I didn't get my ethics out of uh, meditation initially. It's not like I was, you know, uh, raping and killing and lying and stealing, and then I started meditating and I realized I shouldn't do but that. Has it made you more faithful to your ethics? I think so. but. Um, you know, I mean, for instance, I took a course uh, as a freshman in college that the, 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 the total content of which was answering this question, is it ever, ever okay to lie? You know, it was just all about telling the truth and whether white lies were ever justified. And, you know, that was a formative uh, conversation for me. And, you know, from that moment forward, I had a view of lying that, was, that gave me my ethical code about truth-telling. Uh, with regard to truth telling, which really just transformed my behavior. You know, I don't know, I don't can't remember who I was before I walked in the door of that seminar. It's like I don't know how much I lied, I don't know what I thought about lying, but I know that that after ten weeks of thinking about lying and its consequences in my day to day life and the kind of world I want to live in, I I knew that, you know, lying uh but for the most extreme circumstances, you know, the Anne Frank circumstance, like you know, is this little Jewish girl in your house? Uh um you know, tr telling the truth is a, is, a, is a deep ethical imperative, I think. And um, you can come to that in a perfectly secular way. And uh, I, think, I think secular, you know, we could have a, a secular articulation of, of really everything that we think may be necessary in religion. I mean, let's say we need ritual, for instance. Let's say ritual is doing something that is absolutely essential psychologically and socially for us. There's no reason why we can't have rituals that that don't that uh, are divested of bullshit. You know, that that, that don't require uh, a a down payment of of irrational uh, false claims to certainty at but the door. Is the ritual, in some sense, always arbitrary or irrational? I mean, there's no reason to do any of that. I mean, to do you know? Well, no, no, not necessarily, because you know, like I got married not that long ago. You know, given my religious uh, uh, heterodoxy, I, you know, I, I couldn't just pick off the shelf, you know, a, a Buddhist ritual or a, or a Christian ritual, um, and so we had to craft a, a a secular ritual that was not embarrassing, and it turned out to be, you know, exactly what we had hoped for. Um, there was a way to bring everyone in our lives together and kind of mark this moment with some profundity. That didn't require that anyone think they knew something that they, they didn't know about the universe. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, my second question about this is, uh, I think I kind of agree with you that if the world is around and in good shape, a hundred years from now, it will probably be the case that there is a certainly among educated people a spiritually based ethic that is. Uh, well, certainly not based on old-fashioned uh, uh, personal theism, a theism based on a personal deity, certainly not based on, on conventional conceptions of the Abrahamic God. That, that's kind of my, my guess. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that it will have to do with some of, with, with, with this spiritual discipline such as meditation and philosophical insights such as you find in some of the Eastern traditions and so on. Um, but there's also the question of how you get there. And I think I, I already see 
tell me if I'm wrong. I, I see more and more Christians kind of talking like Buddhists. I mean, more and you, you hear more and more about kind of living in the moment. Some of them are doing meditation, and, and I can imagine people being slowly weaned off of some of their more archaic beliefs uh, in a way that would ultimately be more graceful than kind of grabbing them by the shoulders and, and saying, don't you realize how irrational old-fashioned religion is? Um, and, and, you know, even within Islam, you have uh, a Sufi tradition, which at least in some of its modern variants is, is, is very kind of meditated, not in, not in all, and not in all of its historical manifestations. But, but I mean, it, it, isn't it possible we, we, we want to kind of encourage gradual evolution and, 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 and do a little less yelling about how crazy they are? Uh. Yeah, well, I think again, there's there are roles for different voices. You know, I, I think that's a good thing. And I mean, I I, I stand in, in a unique position now because I receive you know thousands of emails in response to my very radical criticism of, of religion, and I can see the the spectrum of effects. I mean, there are the people who are just frankly offended and think I'm the antichrist, and then there are people who who can't buy the, my whole argument hook, line, and sinker, but they think. You know, now I, I recognize some of the liabilities of the religious polarization of our world in a way that I didn't, and and so there's a kind of there's just a there's a modulated effect even of a, a very extreme and radical criticism, uh, which I'm noticing. Uh, but yeah, again, I think you know I hope you're right about a hundred years from now that we have a. a Actually, I didn't predict it. I just said if we're around, and yeah. the world is well, yeah, in good shape. I agree. Yeah, I think it's. You know, having a hundred years uh, where um, uh, we are this polarized along religious lines, and we have this many people looking forward to the end of the world for for uh, eschatological reasons, I think that's it's, it's hard to imagine we're going to get many centuries into the future. Now, let me let me just uh, quickly ask you a, a, a couple of questions. One one about um, whether sometimes religious belief. Is is kind of not right, but closer to the truth than a lot of forms of atheism. And let me give you this this parallel. You're probably familiar with the famous uh, encounter between uh, you know this theologian Paley and the whatever the the 18th century and the whole blind watchmaker mm -hmm. thing, where he said, "Look, you look at, it, at an animal. It's like it has the intricacy of a watch. If you found a watch, you would know that it had been created for for, for a purpose. You know, and these animals, they do things. They have goals. They you know, there, mu there must be a God that created them. Now, suppose somebody had come along and said, no, no, you're wrong. Animals, they, have, they were not created by anything. They've always been there. They have no purpose. There's nothing they're designed to do, okay? Um, now, as it turns out, the truth is somewhere in between. Natural selection created them and actually did imbue them with kind of purposes. So they have a creator, they have designer, they have purposes. Who would you say was closer to the truth at that point about animals? Somebody, the hardcore atheist, who would have said it's they're completely without design and purpose, or Paley? Well, I think when you unpack what people actually mean, religious people actually mean by design, by designer, and by a purpose, I think the atheist still has to win that argument, and certainly has to win it now in the 21st century. Um, I mean, one thing I think that is doing a lot of uh, diabolical work in this in uh, the dialogue of, uh, among people who think there's a, religion and science are compatible is, this, is a failure to make this distinction. Uh, what religious people do, uh, and they can be scientists, you know, they can be Francis Collins, uh, when, you, when they look at a piece of scientific data, they ask the wrong question about it. They ask, is this compatible with a belief in a Christian God, say? So they'll look at a piece of data like 99% of all the species that have ever lived are now extinct. Okay, and they look, they look at this and they say, well, is this compatible with the God of the Bible? Well, of course it is. You know, it, it, the answer to that question is always yes, because who can understand the will of God? Maybe he wanted to destroy 99% of his products for you know, reasons we can't fathom, etc. But if you ask yourself, is this fact suggestive of the existence of an omnipotent and omniscient and perfectly benevolent God? I mean, would, you, in your, would any person in his right ma mind look at the fact that Ninety-nine percent of all the creatures that have ever been created are now extinct. You know, ninety-nine percent of the, the products have failed. Uh, would this lead you to believe that that uh, if there is a God, He's omnipotent? Well, no. 
Uh, or would this, would this lead you to believe that there is a perfectly benevolent God? No. And why would you even think there was a God on the basis of this? And it's true with everything that, that religious people rationalize. It's true with the Holocaust. You know, is, it, is the Holocaust compatible with, it, with God? Yes. I mean, maybe he hated the Jews. Maybe he wanted the Nazis to have a circumstance where they could sin with all their free will. Okay, that you, can, you can always rationalize those things, but you would never look at the Holocaust and say, you know, this convinces me that there is a perfectly benevolent, perfectly powerful, all-knowing God looking out for us. And that, that's, that's a distinction that I never totally, gets... I totally accept the, 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 the argument against an omnipotent, benevolent God, but the question I'm asking is, if two people are addressing the question of whether, in this case, they're addressing the question of, do individual organisms, are they products of, in any sense, design? Do they, in any sense, have a creator? Do they, in any sense, have a purpose? One person said yes, one person said no. At the level of the questions as I've asked them, the person who was right was the religious person. And, and, and I guess the, the analogy I'm, I'm pointing to is, is if you look at not individual animals, but look at natural selection itself and ask yourself, does it look as if it, it, it was m moving towards something that is best explained by it in some sense having a design and a purpose? In other words, it was very likely to create self-reflective intelligence, which would make moral progress or something. Let's take that version of the argument, which I, I'm actually sympathetic to. Right. That's not to say it was created by something omnipotent and benevolent, because clearly there's been too much suffering for, for that to have been the case. Mm -hmm. but, but the assertion, the, the suspicion that this historical process is in some sense a product of design, in some sense has a purpose, um, if it, if it turns out to be the case that it did, even in the kind of uh, sense that animals turned out to have a designer, which in other words, maybe it was just designed by a process, but a process of selective retention, that you know, whatever. Um, won't, won't it be, if we found that out someday, wouldn't I, wouldn't you be hard pressed to say who was closer to the truth, you know, uh, some theologian or, or Dan Dennett, who, who had been closer to the truth about the historical process, if it turns out to, in some sense, have a creator and, and designer, which is one reason I'm kind of reluctant to dismiss theologians uh, and reluctant to embrace hardcore atheism, I guess. Well, are you saying that there, it may turn out that there was a creator who, in advance, conceived of a purpose for creation and then implemented it through natural could selection? Be, could be they, 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 some conscious thing, put specks of bacteria on Earth, knowing that it would blossom through a process of natural selection, could conceivably be some process of meta-natural selection. Uh, there are actually some cosmologies compatible with this that involve the creation of the, the universes through black holes or something. I, 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 I'm just saying. I, well, see, the thing is, I think you actually agree with me that a lot of atheists have a, a, an unjustifiably constricted view of the realm of metaphysical possibility. And I guess I'm asking you if they don't have an unnecessarily constricted view of the realm of, in some sense, theological possibility. I and mean, we don't know, you know, what natural selection, why it started. I, I, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, but see, the, see, I'm content to leave it there. You know, I don't know, and we don't know, and yet I feel no temptation to to fill that gap with any of these clearly. Uh, imaginary, I mean, these imaginary friends that, that we as cultures have created, you what know. You mean personal God? Yeah, yeah, and so, and so that seems to me clearly wrong, as wrong as wrong gets. I mean, it's, it's wrong to put Zeus there, it's wrong to put Baal there, and it's, it's wrong to put Jehovah there. Um, and so let's say we, you know, I'm completely open-minded uh, on the future, about the future deliverances of science. I mean, if we find that we are running as a a simulation on an alien supercomputer. You know, if that's the, the story, you know, the answer at the back of the book of nature, wow, that's a big surprise. And, you know, it, it's going to have to be compatible with the data of our world. Yeah, yeah. And it would be, and it's not, it's not a theistic God, but, it, you know, even that would be an intelligent designer, you know. Um, a quick, quick related question on, on the subject of death. There's a philosopher at Princeton named uh, Mark Johnston. Uh, it's developed a very interesting argument that I think in some ways you'd be sympathetic with based on your spirituality. It's an argument for the afterlife, but not in the sense that I, Bob, shows up after, somewhere after I'm dead, but in the sense that if you think truly about your connection of other people, it gets back to your idea that, that the sense we have of the narrowness of our own consciousness and sense of self is kind of illusory. Mm -hmm. And there's actually more in the way of true contact with other things, other people. 
he's saying if you think truly about that and strip yourself of the natural illusion, it makes sense kind of to think. You should connect your own identity with posterity in a new way. You, you, you should think that if, if when I die someone else is born somewhere, that's really enough because I am them and they are me. And it's a secular argument uh, about an afterlife. Uh, and it's, you know, rigorous, whatever you think of it. And again, I would kind of say, um, if he's right, and, and, and you probably would not exclude the possibility until you'd read the argument, I think, given its nature, um, isn't someone who has a more naive view of the afterlife, but that, and, and, and derives some hope and confidence from that and confronts death with some degree of equanimity, aren't they closer to the truth, if he's right? And somebody who goes, uh, I just can't, death, it's just the end, I can't bear it, it's, it's hopeless, it's freaking me out. Right. Is that, you would not concede that? Or? Well, yeah, well, I would concede that, that facing death with equanimity uh, at some level is, is the goal for all of us. I mean, we want, to, we, want to find, we want to find out how it is possible to be truly happy in light of the reality of this world, which is in one of those realities is death. And, and f worse than death, in my mind, is the fact that everyone we love dies before us. I mean, if you just live long enough, you are going to lose everyone you love in this world. And that is, in some sense, even more horrible and mystifying to me than just the fact that, you know, uh, I'm going to die at some point. Um, you know, I, I, we go to sleep every, I mean, the irony is we're actually not afraid to lose our experience of the world. We, we all happily go to sleep every night and we just surrender consciousness, uh, or at least it seems we surrender consciousness. Um, and we're not holding on to the bedsheets at the last moment saying, don't, you know, don't let me go, don't let me go. And, and this captures a lot of the spirit of uh, Mark's argument, and if you said to somebody, would you rather die tonight after you go to sleep or wake up with complete amnesia and be moved to another house? They would say, "I'll take the amnesia scenario," right. and, he, and, and he's kind of saying, "Well, that that is the situation right. in some very true sense, which I think you yeah. might you might actually sympathize with." So, so you might accept that not only is should it be our goal to confront death with equanimity, but if we really understand the metaphysics, maybe that's an appropriate way to confront yeah. death. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Lucretius got at this point where he said, "You know, where death is, I am not, and where I am, death is not." I mean, that we we kind of you know, if, if death really is the extinction of consciousness, then we're kind of we're never going to meet it. You know, we're just going to pass. Uh, you know, it's just the obverse of our situation. Um, and I don't know what death is. I mean, I'm actually open to far more spookier ideas of of rebirth and reincarnation. Trot some, trot some out. What, what's what's the spookiest thing you're willing to countenance? Uh, well, the weirdest thing. Yeah. You, well, you know, this guy Ian Stevenson at the, the University of Virginia, a psychiatrist who's done. Okay, he's got this kind of lone operation studying uh, uh, evidence of reincarnation and rebirth and xenoglossy, you know, unlearned language where a kid at age two will start speaking in a dialect of Bengali that, that no one for 2,000 miles has spoken. Um, this could all be elaborate scientific fraud. I don't know. I don't know him. I don't know. I mean, I'm not close to his data. But if it's not fraud, it's very interesting and spooky stuff. Uh, and I'm just open-minded on that. I'm open-minded on psychic phenomena, which is the consternation of many atheist critics of my book. You know, if telepathy is a reality, I'm interested to see the data. I mean, maybe it's bogus, but um, there seems to be some data there that has been sufficiently stigmatized that no one really wants to pay attention to it. Uh, so, you know, I just, no, I don't know what is true of these situations. I mean, if it turned out that minds exuded some kind of new waveform we haven't detected, and some people can pick up on it and read minds or something, that actually wouldn't violate any of the basic tenets of science. I mean, at one point we didn't know about electro the electromagnetic right. waves. And, and the truth is, science itself is implying weirder things than that. I mean, these physics, uh, you know, these uh, ideas of time travel, ideas where causality can work backwards as well as forward. So, yeah. my mind's pretty open. Uh, I guess the last question is, um, did, I mean, in terms of confronting something like death, has atheism come at a cost for you? Were you brought up religiously? Did you used to have a more comforting idea of these things? Um, well, I, I would take issue with the idea that, that the common religious framework is comforting. You know, it's really, it's not comforting for me to realize that, that the difference between calling God by the right name or the wrong name 
uh, is a difference that matters for eternity and people will really be languishing in hell uh, because of having made the wrong decision. Uh, it's, you know, when you look at the details of, of, of what religious people believe, there is, uh, uh, you know, much, much that is comforting, perhaps. The idea that you're going to be reunited with your family and your pets in heaven is, is comforting to people, I'm sure. But um, uh, I, think, uh, I think the real comfort comes from being able, in the present moment, to transcend your feelings of fear and anxiety and grief and depression. I mean, we, what we need is a, a way of, of reali realizing our situation in the world, moment to moment, which frees us of the, the imperatives of you know, a, a rising mental discomfort and physical discomfort. I mean, physical pain is a reality, and you know, until science cures it, which may in fact happen, and that would be great, um, you know, we're all, we all live with the day-to-day -day possibility of, of suddenly feeling tremendous pain in the body. Now the question is, is it possible to be at all okay with that, you know, before the morphine hits? And you know, to my mind, meditation reveals that it actually is possible. I mean, it's actually possible to be writhing in, ang in agony or to be, you know, incredibly, incredibly nauseated or, you know, with something really that is classically unfulfilling as an experience and to, and to recognize that, that awareness itself is kind of tri intrinsically at peace. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily easy to do, but it's, it's possible to do. And, and I think, you know, you know, maybe one day we'll get drugs that will allow us to do it e very easily. You know, maybe there'll be a mindfulness pill that will just, you know, give you an ability to just kind of drop your clinging to your experience, if only for a moment. But, I mean, these are, this story is, is for a completed science of the mind to write, I think. And a completed science of the mind will tell us, you know, I'm not saying we'll ever get there, but, you know, a thousand years from now, it'll tell us whether human minds are permeable to each other beyond, uh, you know, space and time. And, I mean, who, who knows what the, the final story is. But it's, it's not going to be a matter of, of, of dogmatism uh, comforting us in the end, I think. Okay. So, I mean, you view a lot of conventional religious worldviews as, as much terrorizing as comforting. But, but you're not one of these atheists who escaped from such an upbringing. No, I'm not. I'm not reacting to, you know, the nuns who beat me with a ruler. Or, you know, that was not, none of that. So, yeah. and uh, and you find yourself able to confront death uh, with. Uh, I don't know. How does it seem? You're 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 you're, 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 you're too young to worry about it a whole lot. But uh, well, I certainly I worry my fair share. And you know, people close to me have died. And you know, I know um, I know what it's like to have someone in your life just disappear. And it's. I mean, it's it's mind-boggling that that everyone's going to disappear. I mean, I I don't know how to put a um, a cheerful face on that. I mean, it's 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 it is a um, and the fact that it can happen suddenly and inexplicably and in ways that that are in themselves horrible. I mean, it's just um, and the, my real problem is the fact that it happens so so much of the time unnecessarily based on religious conflict in the world and. That we have people in the world who think that death at the right moment is just the best thing, you know, it's the career opportunity to end all career opportunities, and they seek it out. I mean, this is speaking specifically of jihadists. Um, that's what is, has animated me in, in making the noises I make. But you know, the, I guess the good news is there's some hope in, the, in, in, in how many adherents of religions that subscribe to the idea of an afterlife or, or heaven have actually lived their, their lives in ways uh, that, di that didn't really uh, take the idea that it's, I mean, there's almost, it's, it seems to me good news that almost no one actually welcomes death when you come down to it. Yeah. And, and certainly not you, apparently, yeah. uh, or me. Yeah. Well, anyway, death is always a, a natural note to end on. Right. So, so here, I'll, uh, I'll thank you for, yeah, for well, this. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah.